All right, here we go, my friends. We are going to begin to build what I believe to be the most friendly, the most giving, the most kind, the most empathetic, the most caring economic diagram ever created. And what I mean by that <clears throat> is the neoclassical aggregate demand and aggregate supply diagram is a diagram that we will use all throughout our entire studies of macroeconomics. Like this is fundamental, fundamental, fundamental. This neoclassical aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram is that important and maybe even more important because this diagram goes on to help us out in international economics. It goes on to help us out even in development economics. And it's a diagram that <clears throat> is old. It's a diagram, it's the classical diagram, right? Neoclassical means that, that current economists have gone back New economists have gone back to the classical ways. And from this, we're going to be able to glean unemployment. We're going to be able to glean inflation. We're going to be able to glean economic growth. Okay, So it's just a diagram that keeps helping us and helping us and helping us. And learning how to draw it perfectly is essential. Okay, So I'm going to go through how to draw it. I'm going to first draw it by hand so that we can, you can see it. If you want to draw it along with me, fantastic. Um, and then the last slide you'll see is like a cleaned up version of the diagram so that you can really, really grab it. Okay. So something really important to know right away is you're always going to have a title and the title is going to be the economy of whatever country you want it to be in. So the economy of Tanzania, the economy of Sierra Leone, the economy of Nepal, the economy of Israel, the economy of Egypt. Okay, so that's the title. Then you're always going to have average price level over here and a currency. And the currency, of course, must relate to the, the name of the country that you put on it. It wouldn't make any sense for it to be, you know, Nepal and then have dollar signs here. So make sure that that's always connected. Otherwise, you'll lose marks. You'll lose points on the diagram itself. So average price level and a currency. And then the origin, of course, is zero. Then we're going to have real GDP, right? This could be real output. It could be national income. I like real GDP because I think it looks cool. <laughs> I don't know. It's also really easy to remember. And, and real GDP is related to aggregate demand. And aggregate demand is going to be the most active line on this diagram. And so therefore, I think it's best to use that diagram or rather that label. Okay. So there's the structure. Now, of course, you've seen this before, right? But we'll draw it again. We're going to have the aggregate demand curve that's going to go like that, right? And we're going to label this always, label this um, AD1, okay? So this is going to be aggregate demand 1. And then we are going to have the short run aggregate supply curve because we are dealing with the neoclassical model. So we are going to have a short run aggregate supply curve, okay? And we want to label that the same, right? We're going to, not the same. We're going to label that S R A S one. I always put those subscripts there because there, because even if the line doesn't move, it doesn't matter if you have the subscript there. It's just helping you understand that that is the original point because something's going to happen. This is the thing. Like in all of economics, there's going to be a base diagram and an event. So the base diagram is what we're, what we're drawing. And then there's going to be an increase in aggregate demand or maybe a decrease in aggregate demand. So you're going to end up with 81 and then an 82, or you're going to end up with, you know, an SRAS1, SRAS2, okay? And then the last line that we have to draw on here, which shouldn't be any sort of mystery to you because you have been studying this, is the long run aggregate supply curve, which is going to go right there, okay? And we are going to label this, imagine what we're going to label it, but L, R, A, S, and we're going to put one there. And then we got to make sure that we include our new macroeconomic equilibrium, which is happening right there and right here. And this is going to be P, L, one for price level one. And this is going to be the variable of Y, one. Okay. Now. That is how I draw it, and the reason I draw it with PL1 and Y1 is because, guess what? When you start counting something, you start with what? One. You know, one, two, three, four. You don't start with F, two, three, four, or E. And so a lot of textbooks, and maybe even your teacher, might tell you to have that be YF or PL1. 
PL with a subscript of E for equilibrium. And I just think that's too confusing. There is, doesn't really matter how you label it. At least in the IB, you can have it subscript like PL 400 if you want it. But what you need to do then is associate that with the analysis down below. But for me, this is the best way to do it because that way you know where the story begins because the story is always gonna begin with this diagram right here. Okay, so it's the neoclassical rule of 10. Why is it the rule of 10? Because, check it, check it, check it one, two, we are going to realize that there are 10 elements here, right? Average price level is one, currency is two, PL1 is three, zero is four, the origin, Y1 is five, real GDP is six, AD1 is seven, SRAS is eight, LRAS1 is nine, and the title is 10. And there you have it, the neoclassical rule of 10. And if I clean that up a little bit, it looks like that, okay? So that right there is the perfectly drawn neoclassical aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram. It is from here that happens all of your economic analysis, whether it be economic growth, whether it be um, cyclical unemployment, whether it be um, showing economic, like a decrease in economic growth. Do we want to show unemployment? Do we want to show inflation? The demand pull, is it cost push inflation? Like all of the scenarios that are going to happen down the line, like you don't even need to know that stuff right now. It all starts with this particular diagram. So if you don't know this diagram, you're lost. But if you do know this diagram and you draw it perfectly every single time, do you know what happens? You don't have to think anymore. If they ask you for the neoclassical diagram or they ask you to express like economic growth on a neoclassical diagram, forget the economic growth part, boom, draw this diagram. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then look at the question. Oh, economic growth? Oh, that's just an expansion or an outward shift of aggregate demand. Oh, they want to show that the economy is in recession? Oh, that's just an inward shift of aggregate demand. Oh, they want to show a supply side, sock, sh supply side shock? Oh, cool. That's just an inward shift of SRAS1. So, oh, they want to show long run aggregate supply, like an improvement in the quantity or quality of factors of production. Oh, cool. Yeah, just move LRAS out and have LRAS2 and make the appropriate adjustments. Like this diagram is the base diagram for all of macroeconomics. So study this, study this, study this. This is the diagram that never stops giving. It is the reason and the way in which you can express um, so many things in macroeconomics and now you know it. So welcome to the club, my friends. And onward we roll, onward we roll to the next diagram in macroeconomic equilibrium.